But it's a law that protects the poor. The wealthy could no longer escape from what they'd done by offering money. They had to also have what was done to them, what, what they did to others done to them. And then finally, the cultic calendar is all part of this. There's a sabbatical year spoken of, and that is originally here because it helps the poor and it helps wildlife. There's something um, beautiful about that. It's later that it's seen as owed to God through the priestly school. God owns the land, so we worship God by doing nothing. The three annual pilgrimages um, are spoken of here that are very, very important, but they're tied originally, as you'll see in this, to feasts of the, um, the land, agricultural feasts. And so could I just conclude all of that the Decalogue and these chapters here, what is the relationship of Old Testament law to Christianity? The fathers spiritualized all these laws, so they saw them as symbolic. We don't keep them Christians, but they symbolize something. The medievals, they symbolized too, but they kept some of those laws, such as the law of asylum and the lex talionis. The Puritans kept the Old Testament. Interestingly, they introduced Jewish names as well as Jewish laws. So there are plenty of Joshua's and Jessica's and uh, Samuel's and all that coming to the English language through Puritanism. The Enlightenment was very good because it saw how time-bound most of those laws are, including the Decalogue. And today, we tend to see that. And we tend to see that it all needs to be reinterpreted for our day. But above all, we see that Jesus had that strong sense of how to interpret law so that it is not a burden, but it's something that helps us in our relationship with God. Thanks, good people.